Welcome back to another episode of Costume Co. and the third and final part in my three-part series on the costumes of Westworld. In this episode, we will look at the costumes of the hosts, or synthetic humans as they're sometimes called, in the park. Warning, there will be spoilers for the entire first season of Westworld. In a New Yorker interview, creator Jonathan Nolan says that he took inspiration from Sergio Leone's films for visual and character reference, Philip K. Dick novels for artificial intelligence dilemmas, and the Grand Theft Auto games for world-building and interlocking narrative. Meanwhile, costume designer Anne Crabtree says, for them, the hosts, we look to fashion from the 1850s through the 1890s and mixed it up with very iconic references from Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Westerns. We also looked at images of Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, and even Steve McQueen to create these rugged, manly looks that would make the guests feel like they were stepping into another time. But I'm never really a designer who likes to go to other people's versions of a time frame because while the films might be awesome, for me, the great pull is towards real life. Pictured here, the Melody Ranch Studios in Santa Clarita Valley, California, stand in for Sweetwater, the main town in Westworld. The Lone Ranger, Gunsmoke, and more recently the Magnificent Seven were all shot at this studio, which was established in 1915. While it would have been easier to just buy clothes off the rack, Ann Crabtree says, Some days we hope we could just go down the street and buy something, but we never could. Actually, where we were shooting above Los Angeles was this very cinematic and deserty location, but it doesn't allow a lot for shopping. There was like one fabric shop. Crabtree says we had to not only make the clothing, but we even had weavers in upstate New York making the fabric so it seemed authentic. In the pilot, we had used this vintage fabric, but we needed loads for the series, so we had people in L.A. printing. We printed, weaved, and dyed our own fabric to lend the authenticity to the show. So it was a beautiful circus. It's next-level costume design. And because Crabtree had taken over from Trish Somerville, who had designed the pilot, Crabtree wouldn't even dare count how many costumes were needed. She was so terrified that members of her team might run screaming out the door. Crabtree says, to recreate established costumes, we had to either weave it, then paint over it, or we had to print it. The hosts die every episode and things explode and shred, and on horseback things get ripped every day. Like in her work in The Handmaid's Tale, Crabtree prefers to make everything from scratch, saying, The world of Westworld is so big and you think, oh God, how much am I going to need? In the end, we actually had to build nearly every single piece for anybody that speaks because there's so much detail. You get into the habit of making everything so it can be your vision and very story specific. Young Robert Ford is a first-generation host that we first see in the unclaimed territories of the park. Crabtree explains how she dressed the character in a way to excite actor Anthony Hopkins, who plays Dr. Ford. If you look at episode two, there's a host or robot who's a little boy, and we try to mirror the look of Robert Ford in the little boy host. It had its roots in Edwardian times, and we tweaked it for Sir Anthony. I often try to help an actor by dressing the actors in the scene to either support him or antagonize them. Crabtree says, I try to surprise them a bit on the first day of shooting, and I think he was surprised and happy. Sometimes I don't mention it, but I let the actor show up and see what unfolds. Our job is costume, sure. It's a shirt or a pair of pants, but what it actually means is quite large. The little boy's costume, of course, looks like a childhood version of Ford, although he wears knickers instead of trousers. Hector Ascaton, a park host, plays Westworld's most wanted bandit. He is a most definite black hat. Crabtree saying, Hector is all in black for many reasons, most of all that he's a badass and he's a gunslinger. In the most general terms, he's going to go for a black or a darker hat. Pilot costume designer Trish Somerville says of Hector's pinched cowboy hat, I found a hat in a book from early 1900s. It had leather tooling all over it, so I had that made for Hector along with his boots. The hats and boots played a lot into who who those characters were. 
how they presented themselves and how the actors felt about themselves as that character. The black and light gray striped trousers, meanwhile, seen on Hector, were sometimes called thunder and lightning pants. In this picture, you can see that the hat has been tooled on the bottom portion as well. Leather tooling or carving is a technique of creating a three-dimensional appearance to leather hide by a process of cutting and stamping the surface. This technique is commonly used on belts, bags, and saddles. The stamps can come in a variety of patterns. Of course, the best feature of Hector's costume is this magnificent black leather jacket. Now, I'm almost certain this isn't period. It looks rather steampunk to me. The cut has a militaristic quality in that the deep pleated front panel looks like a plastron, which is a feature that we see on many military jackets from the late 19th and early 20th century. Here are two examples of the plastron. The jacket on the left is part of a British cavalry regiment uniform from 1880, and the Indian cavalry uniform on the right is from the National Army Museum in London that dates between 1915 and 1921. You see non-military style uses of the plastron in band uniforms, chauffeurs, bellhops, and mad scientists. Without the plastron, the jacket is rather simple. It's just a cropped bomber style with two-piece set in sleeves and a stand-up collar. The plastron is seamed on the right side, or his left, and riveted in place for extra durability. It's fastened on the left with buttons. In this image, you can see the contrasted red lining. And his costume looks especially good because of all of this breakdown. Somerville says, with the gunslingers and the cowboys, that we aged a lot. Maeve Millay is a host in Westworld who plays a brothel madam in the Mariposa Saloon in Sweetwater. Maeve has a flashback of living on a farm with her daughter when she is attacked by the man in black. She's wearing a very simple ensemble. It includes a striped blue and white gathered skirt into a wide waistband with rows of tucks at the hem and a sleeveless blouse. Her daughter, meanwhile, is wearing a pinafore over her dress, which was a very popular item for little girls in the late 1800s. Here's a close-up of the blouse. It seemed just under the bust with gathers instead of darts. It's buttoned at the center front with little ruffles around the neckline. These two traveling hosts here wear sleeveless bodices on Teddy's train. Here's an example of an American or European cotton sleeveless shirtwaist, as it would be called, from 1905 that's on display at the Met in New York. This type of blouse would normally be worn under a jacket. Here's another outfit from a different flashback. She's wearing another striped skirt. It looks like cotton or linen, but in soft rose tones. The skirt has full gathers, especially at the back. This time she's wearing a blouse with sleeves. Now I think it's white, but the lighting makes it look like it's rose. And in both outfits, Maeve isn't wearing a corset. Her flashback look is in stark contrast to her madam costume. Crabtree says Maeve is a strong, powerful character, so her color is this vibrant fuchsia which stands out in the bar they work at. Clementine is the perfect green color to complement Tandy. There's a beautiful genesis which happens to both. It's quite empowering and you see various elevations via costume of both their characters. And in this scene, Maeve is wearing her complete ensemble, which includes a bodice, skirt with an overskirt or apron, as it's sometimes called, and a long sleeve bolero jacket. And we also get a glimpse of her black petticoat underneath and her boots with a spoon heel. Here's an example of a late Victorian era style leather boot with that type of heel. Here's the same outfit again, except without the bolero jacket. The bodice and swag are in a matching striped fuchsia fabric, while the skirt is floral. Here's a close-up look at the two contrasting fabrics. Both of these are likely silk. Notice that the striped fabric is reversible. The apron is trimmed in this lovely guipure trim. Here's an example of this style of costume on display at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. This American gown is from the 1870s and it's made from purple taffeta and black velvet and it's trimmed with purple fringe. In this good shot of Maeve's bodice, you might notice that the reverse fabric was used in the center front side seams. This gives the illusion that the waist is very tapered. She is likely wearing a corset underneath to give her this extreme bust line silhouette. 
The bodice is closed at the center back with hook tape. Notice more of the guapir trim on the neckline along with gathered lace. Her hair decoration consists of short ostrich plumes, fuchsia velvet leaves, and black silk flowers. One of my favorite parts of Maeve's costume are these beautiful mesh fingerless gloves. The armholes of her bodice are finished with matching piping. According to Crabtree, Maeve's earrings come from Joseph of Hollywood, and while the set pictured on the left isn't the same pair, they are of the same likeness as the one seen on Maeve on the right. Here's a good head-to-toe shot of Maeve in the saloon. When at work, Maeve wears only the apron and not the underskirt, but they swap out her long black petticoat for this crinoline that's trimmed in black eyelet and cream, cream lace ruffles. Her stockings, meanwhile, are especially fun with the black bow garters. Here's Maeve's costume with Clementine on display at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising Museum. Like Dolores, Maeve goes to bed at night wearing a slip, this one black with an accenting fuchsia pink ribbon. Here's a better look at it. It might be cotton or silk or a blend of the two. It's trimmed with this gorgeous bobbin lace and the bodice is covered in bobbin lace appliques. The bodice and skirt are attached at the waist. The skirt has soft gathers. Here's an example of an American slip from that era, although this one dates a bit later between 1900 to 1908. It's made from linen and silk and it's on display at the Met. I found this screen grab of Maeve showing her undies. Well, I can't know for sure, they look like they are still in the era. Here are two examples of drawers or short pantaloons on display at the Met. The cotton drawers on the left are early 20th century while the ones on the right are from the 1900s. Both of these are American or European. Because of the secrecy on set kept from the actors and most of the production crew, Crabtree was tasked with fittings without revealing plot points to the principal cast, including actor Tandy Newton. Of one such fitting, Crabtree says, I met Newton and I said, we're going to try on something and I'm not going to talk to you about it. I just want to do this and please don't ask me any questions. That fitting was for Maeve's escape dress as seen here from the season finale. Clementine is a host who portrays a prostitute in the Mariposa Saloon with Maeve Millay, although she is later replaced by another host when she becomes decommissioned. Like Maeve's fuchsia, Clementine's color is an in-between color in a triad of three colors. In the very neutral tones of Westworld, these two colors pop out like candy floss. Clementine's costume, like Maeve's, consists of a bodice, a-line skirt, apron overskirt, and petticoat. The bodice and overskirt are in this diamond motif brocade, while the skirt, made from a series of panels, is in a contrasting matching brocade. The overskirt is lined in a gorgeous teal silk satin. The color of Clementine's costume can be seen in this gown from the mid-1880s from the John Bright Historic Costume Collection. This three-piece gown consists of a brocade bodice with elbow-length sleeves, a silk underskirt with a knife pleated hem and a generous overskirt with a polonaise style bustle with teal lace trim. Clementine's bodice is trimmed in this beautiful pleated trim, piped around the neckline and armholes and then edged with this pretty black ruffle. Unlike Maeve's bodice, Clementine's bodice is buttoned in the front and the shaping comes from these darts. The back portion meanwhile of the bodice is shaped with seams all matching the diamond pattern up nicely. Here's a shot of Clementine wearing the apron over top of short crinoline trimmed in matching lace ruffles. And you can see the top of her stockings which are held up with these matching lace garters. According to Crabtree, Clementine's stunning earrings also come from Joseph of Hollywood. One of the details I love about her costume is this gorgeous hair comb that looks a bit like a Spanish peineta. Dolores is the protagonist in Westworld and she's played by actor Evan Rachel Wood. Dolores is the oldest host in the Westworld park, but when we first meet her, she is in the rancher's daughter loop. Like Maeve, we see Dolores going to sleep and waking wearing the sweet lace chemise. Here's an example of a lace chemise from the Met. This American chemise dates from 1900 to 1903 and it's made from linen. This camisole from the last quarter of the 19th century is made from muslin, lace, and satin. 
At one point, Dolores meets a guest named Jacob. She's wearing a camisole, this one finished with blue ribbon, and she's also wearing this waist corset that dips up in the front. Some costume historians have pointed out that she's wearing the corset upside down because the busk is fastened left over right. If she was left-handed, then this orientation would be correct, but as you can see from her painting, Dolores is right-handed. The corset is backlaced. I did find this English corset similar to Dolores's. It's dated between 1890 to 1895 and has the same orientation as Dolores's, although the curator might have also have displayed it upside down. This corset is made from cotton plain weave with cotton lace trim. When it comes to the costumes in Westworld, one of the most talked about things is the significance of Dolores' blue dress and what it might mean. Anne Crabtree tries to clarify this by saying in an interview with Hidden Remote, I know that the color is very important to Jonathan Nolan, one of the show's creators, and I can't say 100% all the things that this color means, but I know that starting from the beginning, it was certainly a color that existed in the 1850s to 1890s in terms of the West. It's also a color that makes her come up in the forefront of every scene because there's straw and dirt and earth tones. This way she pops from the frame. We reserve that color for her throughout the whole story. It just looks so beautiful and it's a simplistic design choice because it harkens to the West. It's the color of the sky and where we're shooting in terms of the desert, it really stands apart from the landscape, especially if you're talking about wide, expansive shots in Utah, where everything is very red. It began as a very easy choice. What's going to make her stand apart from the locals? Further than that, that's all Jonathan, so I can't speak to that. Actor Evan Rachel Wood and creator Lisa Joy have both said that Dolores evokes Alice from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, with lots of Alice in Wonderland Easter eggs throughout. Jonathan Nolan says, Alice is one we talked about, but also Andrew Wyeth's painting Christina's World. It was a tilt of the head toward all the different stories that inspired us, a classic protagonist who's on a hero's journey with a darker twist to it. She starts in what should be the happy homestead, but it's not, and she goes out looking ultimately for herself. Trish Somerville designed her amazing look for the pilot. She also looks like a Disney princess. She's also got a leather belt, which is her utility belt. It's also a pretty common trope to dress the leading lady in blue, like we see here with Lori in Oklahoma, Millie in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, and Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. One challenge that the wardrobe department encountered is that they didn't have enough fabric for the duplicate Dolores costumes that were required by production. Trish Somerville had used vintage fabric for Dolores' costume in the pilot, so they just couldn't order any more. A high-tech solution was found, and Crabtree explains, we had to 3D print the fabrics because we needed multiples of everything. Dolores' outfit, for instance, involves a bodice, a skirt, and a petticoat, and we had enough of the original vintage fabric to make three or four of each. But then we reprinted about four more in 3D because we needed to dress her stunt double too. And I'm learning a lot more about this process myself, but what I suspect Crabtree means is that the pattern was 3D printed onto existing fabric. Here's a close-up of the fabric, this one likely the vintage fabric. The shaping of the bodice is created with these two darts. The collar and cuffs are trimmed with blue velvet ribbon, cream blue and yellow cotton braid, and a blue and white dotted pleated ruffle. The two-piece sleeves are set into the bound armholes of the bodice. The bodice has an attached peplum at the waist and you can see the seam just above her belt. One great feature is that her skirt has a pocket, always helpful for women when they wear skirts. And finally, there are pleats at the center back of her skirt, most likely supported by some ruffles on her petticoat. The closest fabric that I found to her caution was this dotted Swiss linen in cornflower blue from an Etsy seller, but unfortunately it's no longer available. In this shot, you can see that her A-line skirt flares out slightly with just a small train in the back. Dresses of this period are usually toe length or about two to three inches above the ground. Here are two dresses from the period with a similar silhouette and color. 
Pictured on the left from 1895 is a day dress that's made by Stringer in Belfast, and it's made from slate blue wool with gray velvet ribbon and stamped tinted metal shapes from the National Trust Collections. And on the right is a walking dress from the 1890s. Unfortunately, I don't know the source. Here we get a glimpse of Dolores' petticoat and boots. Her petticoat appears to be muslin or cotton, and it's trimmed with eyelet lace. On the right is a picture of an American or European petticoat similar to Dolores's that's on display at the Met. This cotton petticoat dates between 1900 and 1909. Here's another petticoat pictured on the left from 1890. This American cotton petticoat is smooth in the front with gathers and a train at the back. And pictured on the right is actor Evan Rachel Wood standing next to a rather sad display of her Dolores costume, including her petticoat. And I'm saying this because it seems a shame that her costumes are on hangers and not on some type of body form, which would show off the costume so much better. Here's a pair of tan leather boots with a spool heel from the Met with a good likeness to Dolores's. These American-made boots date from 1890 to 1895. Crabtree says that they made Dolores' belt from a kit they purchased at Tandy Leather. Pictured on the right is the embossed floral vine belt kit from Tandy Leather. The costume do-it-yourself guide led me to this belt buckle, the same one that is used in Dolores' costume. It's a number five brass from Abbey, England. So I'll leave a link for both items in the description below. Dolores has another look in an earlier timeline with William. It's sort of a sportier, frontier look for Dolores. Anne Crabtree took some liberties with this costume, as I couldn't find anything like this from the 1800s. You know, in fact, you could wear this today and nobody would probably know. It's not that women didn't wear shirts, they just didn't look like this one seen here. In America, the shirtwaist was a button-down blouse that was originally modeled after menswear shirts. The blouses were designed to be worn jacketless and tucked into a skirt as a fashionable item of dress for the independent American woman. Here are two examples from the 1890s on display at the Met. The one on the left is cotton, while the one on the right is silk, but both blouses have stand-up linen collars and cuffs, and the shaping of these shirtwaists are achieved with front pleats. She is, however, wearing the same belt from her other costume. As far as Dolores' pants are concerned, I can't find anything that might indicate that these are historically accurate. Levi Strauss produced their first pair of jeans in 1873, but we didn't see our first pair for women until the 1930s. Blue jeans didn't gain acceptance until sometime into the 1890s. Eventually, the classic style 501 was adopted in the 1890s, but belt loops did not make their first appearance on Levi's until 1922. Wool trousers were by far the most popular trousers because they were harder wearing with the rigors of saddle riding. That's not to say that after the 1870s, cotton duck, canvas, and jeaning fabrics weren't commercially available. They were, but more these laborer trousers, as they were called, looking nothing like our modern day jeans. Dolores' pants look more like modern lady riding pants. Here's an example of trousers worn in the late 1800s America. On the left is a portrait of Arizona ranchers from 1879, and on the right, a not confirmed image of New Mexican rustlers circa 1880. Here's a picture of Pearl Hart. She's a female stagecoach robber from 1899, wearing loose-fitting trousers. Instead, most women would wear a split skirt, kind of like our modern-day culottes or gauchos. I can't believe that I'm pulling out a picture of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, but here is an example of a split skirt from the Old West. Teddy Flood is a host in Westworld in a romantic partnership with Dolores, the farmer's daughter. With his clean-shaven face and good looks, he starts off as a fairly neutral character, his palette sort of a middle tone. He's neither a white hat or a black hat, and his costume is monochromatic in ranges of gray. Perhaps Teddy's character would align with Steve McQueen's bounty hunter character in the TV series Wanted Dead or Alive. Like the guests of Westworld, Logan, William, and the Man in Black, Teddy wears a three-piece ensemble consisting of a waistcoat, jacket, and pants. His gray waistcoat has a notched lapel, while his four-button coat appears to be made of maybe a linen wool blend. 
Like William's jacket, which I do really like a lot, I think it looks a little modern with the lapel fold a little too low. Here's a close-up of Teddy's jacket and waistcoat. As you can see here, there was little if no breakdown done in the pilot episode. Teddy also wears this blue-gray horizontal striped shirt, which kind of mirrors Dolores' dress color and picks up his pretty blue eyes. Teddy wears a felt cattleman cowboy hat in chocolate brown. Like the man in black, Teddy's hat is custom made by Hollywood hat maker Barron's Hats and originally crafted in 100% rabbit felt by master hatter Mark Magea. The one pictured here is a reproduction. Incidentally, they're the same hatters that made Indiana Jones' adventure hat. Teddy's trousers, like Dolores, are rather fitted for the period and might be made from a lightweight cotton duck or denim with a button fly since the zipper had not been implemented yet. In this image, Teddy wears a black striped collared shirt. I'm not sure how he acquired this shirt, but I think it was from the man in black. In this scene, Teddy wears a shorter version of the Union Prussian blue cavalry coat, a uniform worn during the American Civil War. The shorter version of the coat was more practical for riding. Cavalry trousers were sky blue with tin buttons like the one seen here on Teddy. Teddy wears a forage cap with a floppy crown. The insignia on the arm indicates that this was a sergeant's uniform. Here's an example of a standard issue cavalry issue shell jacket by H.E. Harkness from the American Civil War. This jacket has the standard 12 button front trimmed in yellow wool twill tape. This jacket is part of a private collection of Camp Randall Quartermaster, makers of museum grade uniforms for movies and historical documentaries. Lawrence, a criminal, and El Lazo, leader of the revolutionaries, are portrayed by a host in Westworld. Lawrence appears in the present, while El Lazo appears in a timeline 30 years ago. Interestingly, their costumes are identical, I assume, to mislead the audience about the multiple timelines. As El Lazo, the host wears this mauve tone jacket, a silk bandana, and a bound felt cowboy hat. El Lazo's ridgetop style cowboy hat, I'm pretty sure is this dark brown Shetland cowboy hat from Walrus Hats. It's made of 100% Australian wool felt and it's finished with a twisted leather hat band. This hat is available in three colors from the online retailer Fashionable Hats. Under his jacket, he wears what looks like a purple floral or maybe paisley collarless shirt and a brown suede vest with a notch lapel that's fastened at the front with silver buttons. And like William and Logan, the back of the vest is in a lining fabric. Lawrence wears the same costume except that it's been broken down heavily. In this image, you can see Lawrence's suspenders. His mauve trousers are the same straight leg style as Teddy's. Before the 1870s, men generally wore their trousers tucked in as a way to protect the pant legs from filth and being torn by scrub brush in open country. But beginning in the 1870s and through the 1880s, pants worn over boots would often have a flared hem, referred to as spring bottom trousers, to accommodate their boots. Fashion would also dictate that Western men wear trouser legs cut longer in the back, as seen here in this picture. Armistice is an outlaw and second-in-command to bandit Hector Excaton. She is most recognizable by her snake tattoo that covers her face, torso, and part of her leg. Incidentally, armistice means a temporary suspension of hostilities or a truce. Armistice wears a long sleeve cotton undershirt, a suede overshirt with a pointed hem, open sides with grommet and leather lace detail, and a brown leather gun belt. Her pants are very fitted cloth with suede inside panels with a pinked edge. From a distance, it looks like she's wearing chaps. In this image, you can see a leather straight stitch detail around the neckline and the hem. You can see that the suede jacket has cap sleeves and it's open under the arm to ease with movement. Armistice wears a Gus Straw cowboy hat over her rag bandana. Its distinctiveness is in the high crown and the wide brim. It looks very much like this Larry Mahan palm leaf poncho Gus western hat. It's available at a variety of online stores, including Amazon. Here's a look at her shirt. It's made from a very fine woven cotton waffle like you see on many undershirts. 
The shirt is asymmetrical and the shirt flap closes at the sides with these buttons. In a flashback scene to 30 plus years ago, we see the same host dressed in a rather ugly late 1800s bodice with puff sleeves and a full length pleated skirt. To juxtaposition this look against her outlaw costume, the costume department chose a soft mauve striped fabric and trimmed the garment with matching lace trim. That, coupled with her upswept hairdo and her velvet choker, to us, as an audience, it just looks wrong, and my belief is that this was completely intentional. And this ends part three in my three-part episode on the costumes of Westworld. In case you missed parts one and two, I'll leave a link in the description below. What were your favorite costumes in Westworld? Let me know in the description down below. And if you find value in my videos, consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you so much for watching.